My name is Michael Dankwa. I'm a you know, research fellow here at UNU Wider. And uh, I would want to welcome all of you to this session. Um, so, yes, we have 45, what do you call them, minutes. And uh, we have four presentations as well. So we would go straight to the presentations. What we would do is that, yes, you would do your present, uh, present all the presentations, and then after that, we would uh, take the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, questions after that. But if you have any, you know, uh, question, uh, please put them in the Q&A chat, and I would ask you to do that uh, live when it's time for the uh, Q&A. So please do that. Keep your questions coming as the presentations go on. We, we, we will take the first presentation, and it's by, you know, Beatrice. Beatrice is from the Erasmus University, Rotterdam. So Beatrice, the floor is yours. So welcome to this presentation on the effects of firm resilience and policy responses on employment in Central America during the COVID-19 crisis. So um, in a recent World Bank survey of the private sector across Central America, it was found that more than half of the surveyed firms had already reduced the number of employees. Supporting firms thus is essential to reduce layoffs, yet it might be a hard task given the low level of public reven revenues in the Central American region, which is about 18% of GDP, which is still low even by uh, Latin American standards. Among these firms um, in the survey, it was reported that about 11% have received some kind of government support. In this context, then, we explore the question how firm level uh, resilience capabilities interact with government support in the reduction of layoffs among formal firms in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Economic resilience is typically categorized as either static or dynamic. For our research, we defined static capabilities as a general category of resources and abilities a firm accumulated prior to the shock, in this case, the pandemic onset in uh, 2019, whereas dynamic capabilities refer to the specific responses after it. Um, our data is from the World Bank Enterprise Survey, and our sample covers approximately 660 formal firms. Our method is as follows. First, we estimate um, two Latin variables that capture static and dynamic resilience. For static resilience, we consider whether the firm introduced an innovation to the market three years prior to the baseline and whether the firm invested in R&D also at the time of the baseline. And this can be seen in equation one. For dynamic resilience in equation two, we consider whether the firm introduced a new product or service, whether it invested in a digital solution and the share of workers that work from home. All this uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. We then incorporate these two Latin variables um, into our main equation, which estimates the probability of a layoff at the firm level, which can be seen in equation three. For this, we include uh, a number of standard controls like uh, past sales, firm size, type of industry, type of ownership, etc. And also we include the weeks uh, that the establishment had to close due to COVID-19. Uh, we employ a Bayesian uh, framework in which the model estimations rely on the specification of a likelihood function, which in turn um, is solved by using the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. 
We then perform a counterfactual analysis of four different scenarios to assess the effect of firm level resilience and government support, which we call the treatment. This can be seen in table one. And as we can see, the first group includes both forms of resilience and treatment. The second group, both forms of uh, resilience, but not treatment. And then the last two groups, either static or dynamic resilience plus the treatment. We finally compared the empirical cumulative distribution function of these groups uh, using the concept of first order stochastic dominance to assess in which group uh, government support layoffs are less likely to occur. And these are our results. We uh, we find that the only group where we see a reduction in the probability of a predicted layoff is the group where there's only dynamic capabilities and treatment. To illustrate this small but noticeable reduction, the predicted probability of a layoff being equal to or less than 0.5 in um, in this uh, group I just mentioned is around 0 0.6, whereas in the other groups, it stands at around 0 0.4. To visually assess this reduction, we can also look at the proportion of times in which one group exhibits a higher layoff probability than other, um, than other counterfactual groups. So um, in this graph, it can be seen that, um, this uh, curve over here in the left is the comparison of the group where there's dynamic capabilities and the treatment versus a group that has um, both forms of uh, resilience. We can also see other groups where the treatment was included and in all cases this other groups pretty much exhibit uh, the same predicted probabilities of layoff. This is the only one where we see a difference. And um, to further our analysis, we also um, do a breakdown by sector and our results hold. Um, in particular, we see that uh, for the services sector, which can be seen on, uh, on the right side of the, of the slide, uh, the effect is somehow more noticeable. To conclude, our results suggest that government support measures do play a role in reducing the probability of layoffs among firms with dynamic capabilities alone. As I already mentioned, this is proxied, for instance, by firms that uh, arrange some kind of uh, remote work. We also find that the effect of government support does not seem to be statistically different from the effects of a statistic resili static uh, resilience alone with respect to layoff probabilities. The above does not imply at all that COVID-19 support measures should be disregarded, but it really raises a question about the effective allocation of these resources. Is support going to more robust firms where it is less likely to have an effect on employment or to more dynamic and yet less resource abund abundant firms where it is more likely to have an effect because more likely it is more likely that people will be in, in the latter group. It also underlines the necessity of policies to enhance resilience more broadly and um, to go for more continuous uh, government support to develop this type of, of um, solutions rather than, than ad hoc measures. And that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you, you know, Beatrice, for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, many thanks. Yeah. For yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So. Great. If, 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 if uh, anyone has any questions on this, please put them in the, in the Q&A ch chat. And at the end of the presentations, we would ask you to do, to do that live for us. So we would move okay, to, the, we, will, we would move to this second presentation and it's by Fiona. And Fiona is from the University of Joe in Johannesburg. So Fiona, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I hope the, the slides are visible now. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Great. 
Um, I'm going to try and uh, whistle through this presentation uh, quickly in the, in the six minutes. Um, this is based on a joint work with myself and uh, Carmen Naidu. Um, actually, it, it fits uh, very well with uh, Beatrice's uh, presentation, um, and uh, it's great to see uh, this work, and we should, we should definitely talk more. Um, so in our work here, we, we're analyzing um, the impact of uh, the pandemic um, on enterprise performance in uh, developing and emerging economies. Um, we know that uh, the effects of the pandemic um, are, have been very uneven um, across firms within sectors, within countries, um, between countries. Um, and here we, we're analyzing um, three different aspects of firm level outcomes, um, closures, um, employment um, and sales. Um, and how these have been affected by um, various sets um, of determinants. Um, firstly, looking at uh, prior conditions um, at both the firm level um, in terms of um, a firm's uh, productive capabilities um, and other firm level characteristics, um, and also prior country level uh, characteristics, um, including um, GDP per capita, degree of industrialization, um, and so on, which we'll come to further. Then the country level uh, severity of the pandemic, um, the stringency um, of um, uh, containment measures um, at the country level, um, and the, the extent of economic support measures at the country level. Um, and then the, the firm level, um, the extent to which firms have been able to, to adapt um, their, their production or, or services uh, in the face of the pandemic, um, and whether firms have received um, assistance from, from government. Um, so, so broadly, uh, what we're interested in here is uh, what is the relevance of um, you know, these firm level and country level uh, structural features as well as responses for the firm robustness and resilience um, in the pandemic. Um, and here, although we, we're analyzing a range of factors, but we're particularly interested in um, firm level uh, productive capabilities, uh, which I won't go into in detail here, um, and uh, kind of sector and, and, and macro level uh, characteristics at the, at the country level. Um, in terms of um, degree of industrialization um, and uh, industrial competitiveness. So our econometric approach um, is you know, really translating uh, what I've just been talking about um, into an equation, so I'll go through it very briefly. Um, basically, um, modeling firm level uh, outcomes, uh, survival, employment growth, and, and, and sales growth, um, as a function of um, you know, these various uh, sets of determinants, um, country level variables um, measuring the severity of the pandemic, uh, stringency of containment measures um, and the extent of um, economic support, um, and then firm level prior characteristic characteristics, um, firm level uh, production response, um, and uh, 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 prior country uh, characteristics. So we first um, control for, for firm survival. Um, we estimate a, a, a two-step uh, Heckman um, controlling for, for selection bias of firms that remain uh, fully operational during the pandemic. Uh, and we use additional selection uh, variables uh, such as the net profit and a, a, a dummy as to whether the establishment is part of a larger firm. Um, let me just go on to, to the data. Like Beatrice, we're also using the, the World Bank Enterprise Survey. Um, and we're combining this, I'm not going to go through it in, in, in detail, but we, we're combining it with um, uh, other country level um, uh, variables. Um, I think I'm just going to skip this because of time um, and just go straight to, to our results. So I'm just going to show two, two sets of uh, results here, although we have uh, more in the paper. So firstly, um, in terms of the determinants of uh, firm survival, um, we've uh, split this uh, same table into two slides just uh, because it was a bit long to include on, on one slide. Um, so what we've done, uh, we have, um, uh, in terms of the productive capabilities, um, in the re results which I'm showing here, uh, we have um, calculated indices of uh, technological capabilities um, and, and production capabilities. Um, we also have uh, separate regressions, which I won't show here because of, of time, where we um, individually model the, the, the various components of, of, of both of these uh, indices. Um, so just to, to highlight a, a couple of uh, features of interest here, that for, for manufacturing firms, with both our, our linear probability model and the, the probit, 
We find um, production ca capabilities being uh, significant, although weakly, um, and uh, technological capabilities uh, in the LPM, but not in the in the, in the probit. Um, and uh, in the regressions where we uh, look at the individual components of, of these indices, um, you know, in particular, uh, of particular significance are having international quality certification. Um, let me just move on. So this is the second part of, of the same table, which is determinants of uh, firm survival. Um, and here we're looking more at the, um, the, the country level uh, variables. Um, the CRP score, which is the, the industrial competitiveness um, uh, score from, from the, the, the UNIDO index. Um, interestingly, that um, it's highly significant for, uh, for, for manufacturing firms. So this at the, at the country level um, is a strong determinant um, of uh, outcomes for, for manufacturing firms. Um, we also see you know, a, a negative effect of the, the stringency of um, uh, containment measures. Um, and of the, the extent of the, of the pandemic. Um, in this set of regressions, we, we're not seeing any um, overall significance uh, of the, the country level economic response. Um, and then I'll just show the, the employment uh, growth uh, regressions. Um, so this is on, on the uh, firms that, uh, that remained open. Um, so we can see um, you know, some significance from both the technological capabilities index and the product um, production capabilities um, index, um, as well as in this case from the firm level production response. So this is um, the extent to which firms were able to, to adapt their, their production um, in response to, to the pandemic. Um, and in the case of manufacturing firms, a, a positive impact from a firm level receipt of, of, of government support. Um, in terms of the, the country level determinants of uh, firms' um, employment outcomes, um, again, we've see, we see a very strong um, impact of, of the CRP score um, and again of the, the stringency index and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the severity of the pandemic. Um, just uh, very briefly, we also disaggregate firms by, by tech intensity, so comparing low tech and uh, medium and high tech firms. Um, and uh, perhaps just one result of significance here is that for, um, for, for low-tech firms, it's the production capabilities index, um, which, is, uh, which shows up as, as most uh, significant. Um, and for, for medium and high-tech firms, it's the technological capabilities index, um, which I think is, is intuitive. Uh, we're not going to show the, the sales results here because of, of time and just going to, to my final slide. Um, as you would have seen from the, the regressions, uh, they were quite noisily um, estimated. So it seems that there's really a strongly idiosyncratic um, element to, to firm level outcomes. Um, and uh, I'm not sure to say that we, we, we tried a range of different uh, specifications uh, beyond what we, 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 we've shown here. Um, and we, we really found them consistently noisily um, estimated. So I think the, yeah, uh, the pandemic just, uh, it, it seems very difficult um, to kind of comprehensively model firm level um, outcomes uh, during the pandemic. Um, but broadly, um, although the results are a bit uneven, but we, 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 we do find uh, importance of the of both the technological and, and production capabilities indices, um, as well of, as of uh, specific um, components with, within those index. Um, and perhaps what's important to mention about that is that those kind of capabilities are not things which can be built up um, overnight in the, in the face of a pandemic. They are the outcome of uh, years of um, investments, um, both financial and otherwise, in, in, in those capabilities, which proved to be um, important in a firm's uh, resilience and, and robustness. Um, and then at the country level, I think it's interesting to see that the, the degree of um, industrial uh, competitiveness um, is a, is a positive determinant of firms' employment growth. And for me, one of the interesting results from this is that also for services firms, so for even uh, for services firms, the competitiveness of the manufacturing sector um, is an important uh, determinant of uh, firms' em employment um, outcomes. Thank you. All right. M many thanks, Fiona, for the interesting uh, presentation. Uh, so again, if uh, you have any questions, Questions for Fiona, please uh, put them in the Q and A uh, chat. We would come back to that after the presentations. We would move on to the third presentation, and it's by Kenneth 
Uh, Kenneth is from ETH Zurich. Kenneth, please go ahead with your presentation. Hello, my name is Ken Hartkin, and the paper I'm going to present is called When Physical Distancing Becomes Impossible, a Physical Distancing Index Based on Access to Essential Infrastructure, which is joint work with Isabel Günther, Johannes Seiler, and Jörg Utziger. To give you a little bit of a background, we know that limited infrastructure remains a big challenge for many low and middle income countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, both at the macro as well as at the micro level. And lack of such infrastructure can also affect the ability of countries to prevent outbreaks and contain the spread of infectious diseases, such as the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We know that most countries have responded to the crisis with a series of public health measures, including uh, encouraging of physical distancing. And these measures, for example, are uh, school closings, work from home arrangements, and even curfews and suspension of some public services. And we also know that the lockdowns of public life in Sub-Saharan African countries come with immense economic and social costs. So for example, large shares of population are employed in the informal sector. If people cannot go to work, it will, it will result in an instant income loss for most of these people. Um, and as a result, many African countries have quickly started to lift lockdown measures again, despite rising daily COVID-19 cases. However, this was not the case for school closings. <clears throat> In this paper, we propose a very simple physical distancing index composed of five indicators, households with lack of private toilet facilities, lack of private drinking water source, lack of ICT infrastructure to be connected to the outside world, lack of private transportation means, and lack of space measured as people per room used for sleeping. To do so, we use data from the Demographic and Health Survey database for the most recent available survey year. And in doing so, we have a sample of 34 countries between 2005 and 2018 with more than 700,000 households. What we do is um, we calculate the physical distancing index based on a principal component analysis. And then the uh, PDI is calculated for each household. A PDA of one means lowest access to private infrastructure. A PDA of zero indicates no lack of essential infrastructure. We also take into account um, that the lack of private infrastructure leads to more social interaction in highly or more densely populated areas. So we adjust the index by population density. And in addition, use a geostatistical approach based on a Bayesian regression to provide high resolution maps, uh, in particular 10 by 10 kilometers. To show you some results, um, the graph shows the geospatial estimates of the a PDI at the country level, regional level, and pixel level, we see that high risk areas of disease transmission are particularly concentrated in the western part of Africa, such as Ghana, Togo, Liberia, and or Senegal, countries with lower population densities and relatively better infrastructure, such as Namibia, Gabon, Mozambique, and South Africa, uh, show a lower PD, PDI. However, the interpretation of the estimates need to be made in relation to other Sub-Saharan African countries. For example, although South Africa shows a much brighter color, this does not mean that the country has all the infrastructure in place for people to keep distance. It shows that compared to, for example, Burkina Faso, South Africa has, on average, better domestic infrastructure, but still might lay key elements of domestic infrastructure. And moreover, we also know nothing about the actual behavior of people, whether they actually follow a physical distancing regulation, even if this is in principle possible. 
And the right panel of the figure also re revealed some considerable spatial heterogeneity of high risk areas within countries. And to zoom in a little bit, here the results are shown for Ghana and South Africa. And for both countries, subnational heterogeneity is high and high risk areas exist in both countries, particular in highly dense urban areas. Okay, to, to summarize, um, we calculate a physical distancing index based on a multi-dimensional index approach that indicates the potential effectiveness of physical distancing regulation at the national and subnational level. The spatial analysis shows that many households in Sub-Saharan Africa lack essential private infrastructure that undermine governmental regulation to foster physical distancing. We also find large within country heterogeneity and um, our results highlight the fact that different countries face different infrastructure challenges. So if not addressed in the long term, COVID-19 or other infectious diseases will continue to spread despite drastic and costly national measures uh, such as closure of schools and businesses. And um, yeah. our, the limitations of our study include its descriptive nature, lack of information beyond the indicators we are using and the limited generalizability beyond the countries uh, analyzed. And um, thank you. Many thanks, Kenneth, for the interest in the presentation. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, please keep it coming. We would look at all of them after the presentations. So we would go to the last presenter, and it's Carl, right? Carl is from what do you call it, IFRI and the UNU wider. So, Carl, do you have a recorded PPT or you would? Do it live. Uh, we have a video. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm presenting some work on, on food prices, marketing margins, and shocks uh, in the context of vegetables and, and uh, the COVID 19 pandemic in Ethiopia. This is joint work with uh, IFPI uh, colleagues and colleagues from International Growth Center in Ethiopia. Um, so the background of this is, is basically that uh, there, there's been a widespread concern, particularly at the beginning of this pandemic, how food value chains are coping with this pan pandemic, uh, especially in, in low and middle income countries. In Ethiopia, uh, uh, the relevant information here is that land borders were closed with implications to cross-border trade. In the first week, there was a lot of confusion uh, and disruption to domestic trade as well and transportation. But importantly, the country never went into a full lockdown that severely restricted movements like we've seen in some other neighboring countries, uh, uh, such as Kenya. At the policy level, there was always this emphasis on protecting uh, food security. So we've been doing stacked value chain surveys in Ethiopia to try to understand uh, how agriculture value chains function. In February 2020, we conducted one in-person survey uh, focusing on, on the vegetable value chain, the most important vegetable value chain that connects farmers in East Sheva zone in the Central Rift Valley to, to consumers in Addis Ababa. This is a quite important uh, value chain for the country because it supplies approximately 200 million USD worth of vegetables to Addis Ababa every year. Uh, we did quantitative surveys at different levels of the value chain, going from rural producers to urban retailers. And then when the pandemic declared, uh, we saw the opportunity to, to answer and, and kind of look into this question of how the pan pandemic is, is uh, shaping these value chains, we randomly selected half of the original respondents, that is more than 400 farmers, 30 wholesale outlets, and more than 200 retail outlets for follow-up surveys that we conducted in May 2020 and March 2021. We also did one survey just recently last month, but we, we don't have the data yet uh, to, to analyze here. Uh, so in this this presentation I'll be focused on the price data that we have from each round, more than 10,000 price observations for most important vegetables uh, consumed in Addis, tomatoes, onions, green pepper and cabbage. 
so in each round, re we recorded price per units, quality attributes, and, and origin, uh, particularly at the wholesale and retail levels. So we collected this price data at different levels of the value chain. So we can use this data to analyze farm gate prices and cross margins at the wholesale and retail levels. So just diving into the results. So here we see the retail prices in bir per kilogram uh, for different vegetables and for different survey rounds. So I'm going to highlight just the two cases here, the case of onion and green pepper. Uh, so for onion, we see that the prices increased from at the beginning of the pandemic uh, between February and May. And the reason for this was that uh, imports from Sudan that play a important role in stabilizing supply, particularly during off seasons, uh, came to halt. And uh, suddenly there was an undersupply of uh, onions coming into Addis. And this resulted in a price increase. Um, but then in March 2021, we see that the price prices uh, kind of collapsed. And the reason for this is that uh, encouraged by these price increases, farmers uh, in increasingly started cultivating onion uh, in the previous season. And suddenly there was an oversupply of onions to Addis. The green pepper story is basically the opposite. Uh, the, the neighboring region Amhara uh, forms an important market for the green pepper uh, produced in, 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 in these zones in Oromia. And we that in May, that market um, uh, came to uh, came to halt. Partly there was less demand for onions uh, for green pepper from Amhara. There were also some trade disruptions uh, uh, within the country. But then in March, we see that the prices increase uh, in, in March 2021, the prices increase quite rapidly. And again, this is a kind of same bounce back story in reverse. Uh, many farmers switched away from green pepper and suddenly there was not sufficient uh, supply uh, of green pepper. We can look at this more carefully by looking at uh, the composition of these prices, uh, looking at the farm gate prices, the, the amount that goes to the wholesalers and the amount that goes to the retailers. So a couple of observations here uh, that the farm gate prices seem to take, explain large portion of the final uh, retail prices uh, in for almost all vegetable except uh, for green pepper. The other thing is that uh, it seems that a lot of the variation that we see in the final prices uh, or, uh, originates uh, at the farm gate as well. So in way of conclusion, uh, changes in consumer prices are often claimed to be linked to predatory behavior among traders, motivating government's intervention to curb trading activity. Uh, our findings here are kind of against this narrative. Uh, they indicate that the price changes during the pandemic have not been driven by large increases in marketing margins. For most part, it seems that especially farmers are exposed to large price volatility because of domestic and international trade disruptions. Uh, so if anything, we should uh, try to find uh, solutions to support farmers uh, and, and solve the inefficiencies at the farm level. The obvious limitation here is that these are cross margins and, and we've seen in our data that the input prices, particularly fertilizers, are rising extremely rapidly uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And this suggests that the costs at the farm level are also on the rise, not just the, the prices. Uh, thank you very much. Many thanks, Cal, for the presentation. Uh, let me check the chart, the, the uh, Q&A, if I have any questions out there. No, no, I, I don't have any, any but let, let, let me, let, let, let me ask this, um, Fiona, right? Uh, I, was, I was able to follow your presentation a bit. I mean, can you tell us more about how you were able to pull together the data set. I see you've got the the World Bank Enterprise Survey, which is at the firm level, right? And then you have some, then you have the, what do you call it, the astringency, what do you call it, the index as well, which is at the, you know, country level. But I am thinking that within a country, the level of astringency is a bit 
different. So if you have firms which are what do you call it across a country, you know how how do you reconcile using one index which is at the national level for all these firms which, which are located across the country and may not face the same stringency? Yeah. Shall I go ahead with that, John? Yeah, sure, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Um, no, thanks for the question. So, briefly, in terms of how we uh, compile the data set, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a multi level data set. Um, so, the, the firm level uh, data, as we mentioned, comes from the, the World Bank Enterprise Survey um, for, for countries with matched uh, data sets um, over the period from 2016. Um, and then those ones which had the the, the COVID uh, period uh, pandemic, um, COVID COVID period uh, surveys, um, and then we combined that uh, for for uh, the country level prior conditions with data from from UNIDO, the, the World Bank uh, World Development Indicators, and so on, um, and then the the, the country level um, uh, pandemic uh, data we and the, the stringency data we got from from different sources oxford uh, uh, university one the uh, johns hopkins and so on um it, it, those variables are national uh, they, they they measured nationally um in terms of the, the both the stringency um and um on the, the effects of the pandemic um so really yeah you know, they, they measure the national level responses and even even the, the economic support uh, measures that they, they measure national level uh, responses so um as, as far as i know there's no data available uh, for, for countries um, internationally which will give you str sub-national stringency levels so where for example it's uh, different from uh, one state or, or province uh, to another um, so, uh, while the stringency will, will vary, as well as uh, the severity of the pandemic varies, um, th those are country level variables. Um, and I guess, you know, that, that can perhaps be part of the noise in, in the estimation um, where there are, are, are strong differences. We did um, try and, and include a, a, a covariate um, of uh, whether the, the firm is located in the capital city to try and uh, pick up some of that, but we really just didn't find it uh, significant in, in any of the, uh, the specifications. All right, many, many things. Uh, we have one question from TikTok to Kaya. Uh, Lena, can you put her on, on, on the stage? Yes. Uh, TikTok, can you click the uh, audio and video Button at the top. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay. she's there. Yeah, to take. Please go, go, uh, go. Uh, uh, you know, I have. Hi, thank you. I have questions uh, to Kale and Fiona. Sorry, Beatrice, I haven't. I didn't hear your presentation earlier, so I might miss your presentation. The question is that for Kale, for those vegetables. Uh, is it are they produced mainly domestically and what caused the increase in input prices i think you mentioned the increase in prices due to the increase in input prices for fiona i like to know what is the explanation of the negative sign for your export intensity in your services equation i think for the services sector you get negative uh, sign for export intensity if i'm not mistaken thank you all right, many thanks. Yes, Cal. All right, yeah, thanks. Good question. So we did these surveys in in a particular zone in in Ethiopia that is uh, has access to irrigated agriculture, and, and this zone produces a large portion of the vegetables consumed in Addis. So these are indeed uh, domestically produced uh, vegetables that we are focusing on here, and. Uh, and the second question was about the input prices. So this is this is a very dramatic story that these input prices are almost like doubling in a space of one year. Uh, we are still trying to investigate the exact reasons for it, uh, but we see also that the internationally fertilizer prices are going up quite rapidly, as documented by the World Bank, for example, recently. Uh, so so that that's that's one aspect to it. Then uh, there is uh, the exchange rates. Uh, 
at the moment uh, in Ethiopia is with respect to the USD is, is kind of plummeting. And that's that's one part of the story driving prices of basically all the imported goods up. So these are the, the kind of lines of research that we are, we'll be looking at uh, now. And, and we have new data that we've collected and we can look into this a little bit more diving into the story. Thank you. All right, Fiona, you can. Uh, th th thanks for the question. So the export intensity variable we included as a component of the um, production capabilities index, um, but then as, as well in, in separate regressions, which I didn't show here because of time, we also, as I said, uh, modeled those various components uh, separately. So we, we found really weak results um, on export intensity um, when we modeled a separate uh, usually close to zero and usually insignificant. Um, and. Uh, um, in my mind, I think it's it's because of kind of countervailing um, effects of, of export intensity. Under normal circumstances, we would expect this to be uh, a strong or both an, an outcome of uh, firm productive uh, capabilities, uh, can be thought about like that, um, but as well a, a strong determinant of firms uh, robustness and, and resilience and uh, performance and so on. Um, I think during the, the unique circumstances of, of, of the pandemic, um, firms which were more export intensive were also more more vulnerable and more exposed um, to to the the, the downturn in uh, international demand uh, during the, the pandemic, um, and particularly in the early stages of the pandemic, I think uh, um, external demand um, was perhaps uh, more strongly hit than uh, domestic uh, demand, also due to to um, export and import restrictions in certain countries, disruption of value chains, and so on. So I think under these particular circumstances, we found that some firms which relied more on their domestic market were, were, were able to, to kind of manage uh, better. So um, I think it's probably these countervailing um, effects which ended up uh, leading to, to uh, the, the variables showing up, sometimes positive, sometimes slightly negative, but uh, you know, mostly insignificant. All right, many things. Let me let me ask uh, Kenneth. Kenneth, I, I you know I I I kind of like the PDI. I mean the things you you have done and 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 the and the loads of work that has gone into it. But I was just wondering. I mean, how would this help a policy? maker in say Ghana or, or South Africa or elsewhere. I mean how how what are, what 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 would be the main input of this to what you call it the and then another one have you shared this with any of the of the of the policy makers in, in, in this country? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Michael, for your question. Um, so, to s simply uh, respond to the latter one, no, we did not uh, yet. And um, well, we argue that since many countries uh, tried to impose measures of social distancing, they realized very quickly that this did not work, especially. If people, a lot of people work in the informal sector, it's simply not going to work, but they cannot go to work. So there's actually, then there's not much left in order to reduce the spread of a contagious disease. And one thing is physical distancing and the other one was actually school closings, which obviously will have some severe long-term negative effects and school closing were much longer in, in many Southern African countries than, for example, in European countries or in the US. So that's why we think it's super important for the next pandemic to really concentrate on these high risk areas, because when we compare our index with actual COVID cases, then this physical distancing index is actually quite a good predictor or vice versa, there is a high correlation between the actual cases and our index. So that's why we think that uh, this type of research is is pretty uh, important. All right, All right. I, I don't I, I don't have any more 
questions over here. And I think we are right on time. Actually, it's 10.45. So if there are no questions, I would want to close this. Beatrice, we, we, we not, didn't, you know, didn't have any feedback. I, 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 what do you call the, I, I would read your paper and then send you <laughs> some comments. I, I you know. Yeah, I, I think follow. it was too early. Yeah, yeah I think that, that's. Maybe we're still waking up. Excellent, excellent. I think, I think, I think it, 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 but, uh, yeah, it, was, it, yeah. it was a bit early. And then also one thing, I couldn't see the full screen. It was later that I, I you know, saw that I mm. could have it at the big screen. But I, I would read it up and then I would, I would drop you some comments. You know, thank you so much. You know, thanks. So many, many thanks, Beatrice, uh, Fiona, uh, Kenneth, and to uh, Carl for the excellent uh, presentations. And then many thanks to all of you. I can see 18 people who are here with, with us. Many thanks for what you call sticking with us as well. So many thanks.